Good morning. Good morning. My microphone's kind of messed up. Well, I hope that you notice a little change this morning in our place where we gather. Uh, I noticed that there's only two people sitting on this side and five on this side. Uh, and, and I know that those of you in that section were probably worried, if I move forward, everybody's going to see me. <laughs> You're accepted here in love. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, we, we have taken the incredible feat of cutting back the stage. And the reason why we've done this is because we believe that God is doing something here. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I know a lot of times when somebody comes in and they're kind of broken from the world, the last thing they want to do is sit up at the front. Therefore, it would be best if we were able to leave the back rows for them. Notice this. When you're a part of what God is doing, when you're a part of who He is, He will use you in ways you never thought possible. And that's what I want for this place, for us as a people, that no matter who's hurting out there and who's cold, bring them here, God. As a matter of fact, if we get word that there's one of your children out there that need help, send us. We'll go get them. We'll be about our Father's business. Now, I will say that I can literally say this came with blood, sweat, Tears. I had a spiritual experience during this process. It was Friday night, and my life would forever be changed. We were carrying some of the stage out that Alan and I had started to demolition. That's a construction term. And as we're carrying these things out, one of the things we did not do is take the time to take the nails out of the board. And back then in the 70s when this was built, they used four-foot nails. Okay, I might exaggerate a little bit, but there was a board and there were nails sticking out of it. And I was carrying some piece of this out. I don't know, it might have been three, 400 pounds. Yeah. And, and at this point, um, I was not watching where I stepped and I had stepped on a nail. Oh. And as I quickly took my foot off and continued to carry, I began to tell the Lord, Jesus, I know how you feel. For I too have been driven through the feet with the spike. And I knew it was bleeding, but I was not going to look on it. I was going to carry for it. Give me an amen. amen. I soon had a call from my wife and I calmly told her, I stepped on a nail. <laughs> to where my wife, who loves me dearly, began to nag at me, you need to get a tetanus shot. <laughs> what point of that sounds good? <laughs> As I came home, I took my shoe off that night. And I prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, you and I are one. For we both have been pierced. And as I took my shoe off, I expected to see the hole on the top of my foot. And as I looked at the bottom of my foot, I realized, did it get in there? <laughs> and it did. It might have got in that much, but it drew blood. <laughs> I'll tell you this. We have a lot to be joyful for. And you know what's so amazing is that I am full of joy for the people that are here. And I'm not just saying that because that's what pastors say. I truly believe that you are the greatest people on the planet. The world may say differently. The world may have records that say different. However, those who have been broken... And those who cry out to God are the greatest people on the planet. So I have a question for you. Have you been broken by the world lately? Let that sink in. I know we're in the Christmas months, and it becomes a tough time. Those of you in this room that do not have a good relationship with your families, this is a really hard time for you. 
You can turn on any channel and see a movie about families coming together and yours has been obliterated. They don't like you, you don't like them. There's been hurts and pains and scars that may come up during this time of year. So I ask that question again. Have you been broken by the world? Many of you in this room may be in financial distress. Maybe there's single parents in here that are going, how am I going to provide a Christmas for my children? Because we do a good job in our world culture saying Christmas is about getting presents. Many of you in this room are facing things you don't want anybody to know about. But it is absolutely tearing you apart. And here today, I'm going to tell you, have joy. Have joy. It's vitally important that you have joy. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. But Pastor Travis, what does that mean? There is a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness comes and goes, amen? amen? I was happy before I carried that wood. The happiness left me once I walked on the net. But joy is something that should stay with you. Now know this, if the enemy can get you to a point that you no longer have joy, you become weak. Now, you may tell me today, this morning, Pastor Travis, I have no reason to be joyful. And I'm not trying to make light of your situations at all. I'm not saying what you're going through is something that you don't need to tend to or something that is hurting. I'm not trying to negate any of that. But what I am saying is that if you can learn to be joyful in the midst of your trials and tribulation, you will stand tall in Christ Jesus. May I point out something today? Just the fact that you are here is evidence that God is real. Because many of you in this room should not be here. If we don't see that and say, praise the Lord, that he has not forgotten his children. I know this right now. I stand before you, and if it was not for God's grace, I should be dead. Because I've deserved nothing that he has given me. And yet he gives us his joy freely. Know this. In a story out of a book called Nehemiah, we find that in the previous book before Nehemiah and Ezra, that the Israelites begin to mingle with the world. They begin to do things the world's way. God's people begin to do things the world's way, and then they were overcome. They were overrun by an enemy. That point is very powerful for me this morning because I'll tell you this. It is so easy to get mixed up into the world. Can I get an amen? Amen. It is, man, and I can tell you right now. There's things that I will watch on TV like a commercial, and I begin to realize that product is something that I need. <laughs> Case in point, an iPad. <laughs> can I be real with you this morning? Can I get an amen? amen? Do you know how much ministry can come forth with an iPad? <laughs> All for you, Jesus. And it's funny when God goes, how did you ever do ministry without an iPad? I don't know, Lord. How did we all ever exist without cell phones? You know what's really funny is whenever you become of age to get a cell phone. I know my daughter has gotten one because she got into junior high. And she was so excited because it was a rite of passage. Look at my cell phone. I got the cell phone. I'll text everybody. I'll text daddy. I'll text mommy. And, and next thing you know, we begin to call her to make sure she's where she says she's going to be and to ask her to do things. And it really is valuable. If you have a child that has a phone and you are in bed, it is awesome to be able to text them, bring me a Coke. <laughs> It was not long before my daughter began to dislike her phone. 
How did you ever survive without a cell phone? Peacefully. <laughs> but I need the iPad for ministry. That's, that's what I've come to the conclusion. And what happens is I begin to think that unless until I have it, I'm not going to be happy. <clears throat> Doesn't that set us up on Christmas? When we want something and we don't get it and we go, oh, it's still a good Christmas, thanks. Or you get the, the pair of socks. <laughs> I want an iPad, but man, I really needed socks, thank you. <laughs> but may I remind you, when you're starving and cold, you'd have given an iPad for a pair of socks. Oh, Think about that. All these weird things that we make important. And, and we find here in Nehemiah, they begin to do the same thing. They begin to mix with the world and they begin to create their culture around the world instead of letting God be their culture. And pretty soon, like I said, they were overtaken. They became subject to the king of Persia. And I want to read in Nehemiah 8, verse 8 through 18, because we're going to find out when their joy came back to them. Think about this. They're an Israelite people, the people of God, yet they begin to go away from the way God wants to do things and hold on and embrace to the way the world does things. Why? Because everybody's doing that. Pretty soon they get overrun and they scatter. Their city that they had built, Jerusalem, the walls had been burnt down to the ground. They were now exiles. They were no longer a people. However, Nehemiah found favor in the king of Persia and asked if he could rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And as he rebuilt them, they began to tell people, come back home. Come back home. Let that sink in. Come back home. If you're broken today in the world, whether you made it happen or the world itself has fallen upon you, I simply say, Come back home. And as they came home, <coughs> Nehemiah began to gather them all to himself. And here we start reading in verse 8. It says, They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the <laughs> law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy, enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. <laughs> On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families along with the priests and the Levites gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, as that they should proclaim this word and to spread it throughout their towns in Jerusalem, go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees, and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters, as it is written. I'll say that again, temporary shelters. <coughs> So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate. And on the one by the gate of Ephraim, the whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day the Israelites had not celebrated it like this. And their joy was very great. Follow me here. 
day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulations, there was an assembly. Unique story. An exiled people are coming back in. And their heads are hanging way low. And let me explain this to you why they're hanging way low. It's because they used to be somebody. They used to have things. They used to be a great people. But because they began to live wrong, everything fell apart. Can anybody relate to those people? Many of us in this room can go, I remember there was a time in my life where it seems like everything was good, and then I went on and screwed it up. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Some of you in this room may not even have one memory to where everything was good. But I'm here to tell you this morning, have great joy. <laughs> Notice this. There became a moment with all the people, just a brief moment, and a light went off. And I think it is the root of joy. It is when they all came together and they had their heads down and they were talking about, remember who we used to be and you know what, I messed it up and I screwed it up and I'm a failure. And they all came together to Nehemiah and he begins to read the law of Moses. He began to read what God had provided for them. Man, and as they read, their heads continued to hang down lower and lower. Has anybody ever experienced that? Has anybody ever opened up the Bible to get an encouraging word and then the Lord reads your mail? <laughs> You open the Bible to expect to read and the angels to come and sing forth, but instead you're on your face, on the ground, crying out to God saying, forgive me. What a joyful <coughs> moment. <coughs> when we are broken before God and we realize this simple truth, He loves me. He loves me. Out of all the junk I've done, out of all the foolishness I've done, and all the things I've broken, and all the bridges I've burnt, at the core of who I am, at my ugliest and grossest point in my life, God loves me. You can't buy that joy. The King of kings and the Lord of lords loves you. Then Nehemiah began to say, this is a holy day. Ladies and gentlemen, I know our culture has said, for you to be prayed for, you must come to the church house and kneel before God at the altar. As if God only exists on this stage. It is a beautiful stage, I might add. <laughs> that day in your life, when you were at the end of your rope, and you knew if something didn't change, you were going to die. And nobody was around, and you began to cry, and you hit your face on the ground, and you began to cry out to God you didn't even believe in. That was a holy day. That is when all of the heavenly stood up, and Jesus Christ himself pointed out to the Father, there's your child. And then your dad stood up and said, go get my kid. And he began to move in your life. He moved in mine. That is a holy day. <clears throat> the root of joy is knowing that you are loved by God. Despite all your junk, despite all your failures, you are loved by God. 
The rest of the world may hate your guts, but you are loved by God. Yay, yay. So what do we say about this? Now that we're loved by God, it should do something to us. It should encourage us to begin to realize we are worth something. We are created for something that I have value. Where do we find this value? Why don't we ask the one who loves us? God, I am horrible. I have done so many things wrong, so many things that I regret. And there's nothing that I can hide from you. I'm a horrible person. You see who I really am. Why would you love me? Because I created you. In my image. Because before you made your choices, I knew what color your eyes were going to be. I knew what dessert you would like. But God, I screwed it all up. But I can restore everything that has been lost. I don't know why I'm getting emotional right now. It might be because I'm really tired. <laughs> but I am sick and tired of seeing broken people who don't realize how beautiful they are. And I'm a churchman. And to point my nose down at them, say they should have made different choices in their lives. When if I got what I deserve, I'd be dead on this ground right now. And I feel this sense of urgency to embrace the joy of the Lord. This joy that can empower us to move mountains. The joy that can overcome this world. That moment when they begin to hear the words of God and realize that those words were theirs and that God was theirs and that they were God's and they can be returned to Him. To be joyful. One of the things that scripture says is the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Your happiness can pass away. But praise God, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If your God does not change, then your joy should never change. It may be the last day of your life. And you are getting executed for crimes that you've committed. Hypothetical. On that moment, if that person realizes that the Lord loves them and that they are a child of God and are able to say, Lord, I screwed my life up, then that moment is a holy moment. And there should be joy. I know that in my life, God has said, Travis, I've called you to be a pastor of people. I just didn't know which people. Thank you, Michelle. That was funny. <laughs> you know, surely in a pastor's tenure, he may go to the jailhouse once, twice. I've gone a few times. <laughs> and I learn something every time I go. And I've gone when it used to be just the plexiglass and you picked up the phone and you've talked. But now I've also gone and, and now it's the screens. You don't even get to see them face face, you get a computer screen. And every time I've talked to somebody and say, how are you doing? 
do great. <clears throat> and I leave there realizing that because their life has been stopped, they have no time to do anything else except either read, think, focus, no cell phones ringing, <clears throat> they begin to go, I'm beginning to understand who God is. And I know He loves me. And I sit there and I think, Lord, what are the greatest moments in revival? Was it when all of the million church people came and sang your praises? And I think God says it's just as important when the one kneels down in their jail cell and calls out to me, oh, man, I bet that moves God. And you find somebody who's locked up, who's actually now free. And I drive away realizing that I'm still in chains. Because I have nothing to complain about. And I'm missing the joy of the Lord. Why? Because on the way to the jail, that person cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> Ruined my whole day. Jesus, help him. <laughs> Jesus, I need you to help me. <clears throat> be full of the Lord's joy. And you'll be full of the Lord's strength. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. Full of the Lord's joy. Full of the Lord's joy. Nailed to a cross. <coughs> crying out to his father. Lord forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. <coughs> I can imagine that if I was there. And I see a man. Crucified with blood coming out of his hands and feet. Off of his head because of the, the thorns and the piercing in his side. And yet. In his eyes I see joy. I'm going to get frustrated. Jesus, what are you so happy about? <laughs> really? You're nailed up to a tree. You can't come down. Everybody's making fun of you. And you're happy. You are just disillusioned. Do I believe Jesus would look down at me and say, I'm happy. Because I'm saving your life. Mm -hmm. You'll be with me forever. This is a joyous occasion. This is a holy day. Now, I really cannot wait till I get to heaven. Because I'm sure in heaven they have DVR. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll play back that moment when Jesus ascended into the heavens as the lamb who was slain. Bloody and beaten, with a smile on his face. And his dad, our dad, with tears in his eyes, going, That's my boy. Mm -hmm. When Jesus walked, they all knelt down before him. <laughs> the lamb who was slain. And as he got to his father, his father embraced him, said, I'm so proud of you. And Jesus says, thank you, Dad, for letting me be a part of this. And then God said, by the way, here's the keys. And here's all authority. It is all yours. And then you know what Jesus does? Thank you, Dad. I'm going to give it to my brothers and sisters. And, Jesus, and God said, that's my boy. Yet we walk around broken and defeated, not realizing the joy that we should have. <laughs> All the authority. If you got junk in your life and you don't think you can get better, start praising God for the life that you have right now and see if you don't begin to change. <laughs> I know many times we chase rabbits and trying to get things that will make us happy. And what's really sad is when we finally almost sell our souls in order to get something, we realize that it's empty. 
nothing. But if we would just stop, notice, they told them, be still. Be still. In the midst of your pain, in the midst of your worry, in the midst of, of all the attacks from the enemy, be still. Be joyful. Let me act this picture out for you guys. The enemy seeks whom he may destroy. He wants to, to devour you. And the only way he can do that is through circumstances. Now imagine you're walking and the enemy moves and does all these different things. And you know you're walking with God. You're doing business with God. You're humble and saying, forgive me. And all of a sudden, something bad just happens. You wreck your car. Bam, it's totaled. However, you get out and you're going. <gasps> and here comes a surprise. The enemy begins to tell you. Your car's gone. You're not going to get to work. They're going to fire you. And all of a sudden, you just stop and go. Oh, I have joy. Because I'm okay. And the people that I had to wreck with, you, you're okay. Praise God. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for cars you'll provide. You'll provide them and I'll wreck them. Amen. <laughs> Pretty soon, your attitude changes and the enemy gets frustrated. Dang it, I really thought we'd get him with that one. However, he's still got that stupid Christian grin on his face and he's going forward praising God that he's okay. Next week, you lose your job because you can't get to work. They call you and say you're fired. And the enemy goes, now life is over because you're not going to be able to provide, you're not going to be able to do anything. You hang up the phone and you're freaking out for a moment. All of a sudden you stop and say, but God, I have you. And if I have you, I can get through this. Oh, praise your name, Jesus, that you're here. Praise your name, God, that this is not the end of me because this is not the end of you. And then the enemy goes, no way. I could have sworn because they lost your job, we'd have had them. It saved me so frustrated. What is he smiling about? Why is he praising God? He's lost his car. He's lost his job. All of a sudden, the eviction notice comes. Man, life really stinks at this moment. However, the man and woman of God gathers their family around and says, praise God. We are together. He will provide. And the enemy says, what is the deal? I have taken all of their stuff. They've lost everything, yet they still praise God. And pretty soon they're standing out on the street. Somebody drives up and says, do you have a place to stay? No, we don't. They say, well, God called me to drive down this street, and I have a home that's for rent, but you guys can stay there six months free until you get back on your feet. Praise God. And then the enemy's like, Jesus, no fair. <laughs> Jesus tells him, that's what I died on the cross for. My children will not be defeated. That's right. Yeah, you can talk all your talk, Satan. You can try to manipulate circumstances, do all these different things, but you cannot defeat my children. And I'll tell you this, Satan. If my children have my joy, you are in deep <coughs> trouble. They will kick your tail up and down the street. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Next thing you know, let's say that the world comes to an end. Oh, yes, the great meteor that has been prophesied by all of the great philosophers is coming to the earth and it's going to land in post Texas. And from that, I don't know why I said post, but maybe it does. And from that point, the world is going to blow up. We only have two hours left to live, and then we have a choice. How are we going to live? Are we going to do all those things that destroyed us? Or will we sit back and go, in two hours, we're going to see Jesus. Amen. 
Time out. You know how crazy that sounds? <laughs> I mean, let's really look at that on, on a logical level. Let's look at that. You go to somebody and say, two hours left in humanity. What are you going to do? I wish it would get here. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I wish it would hurry up, you know. Two hours, I'm ready to see Jesus. You're nuts. No, I'm full of the joy of the Lord. What a powerful people. I look throughout history and I look at the, the World War II Holocaust. Boy, we don't know suffering, man. Oh, but Travis, we're in an economical crisis. It's all going to fall. We don't know the problems. And yet those people still praise their God. The King of Kings. And would you do the same? Can we do that today? Can we go outside this place and say, my life is good. Yes, I got some things I don't like and there's some things that make me unhappy. But at the core of who I am, I know that God loves me. And for that, I am joyful. Amen. If you believe that, please stand with me this morning. Grab the hand of the person that's next to you, please. Look to your left for me, please. Look at the person to your left. Those who are on the end of the row, just hang out. <laughs> now look to the right. Now look at me. Look like a tennis match for a minute. <laughs> Do you know that the face on your left and the face on your right is a beautiful child of God? Yes. One more thing to look at. When you look in the mirror today, do you know that you are a beautiful child of God? Yes. And when the devil begins to tell you different, you tell him to shut his mouth. Yes. Because he is a liar. Let us leave this place with the joy of the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Lord, I thank you so much for your joy. And I pray that you just show me how I can hold on to it. Father, there's many things in this world that can be taken away from us. But Father, may we understand no matter where we've gone in our journey, whether it's a good journey or a bad journey, Father, you have overcome this world. You will always overcome this world. And Father, may we realize this morning that includes our world. Satan, right now, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You have no authority over the children of God. And I know right now, Satan, you are at work and you are very busy. But in the name of Jesus Christ, no weapon formed against us will ever prosper. You were defeated, Satan. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus, I thank you so much for your sacrifice. And I thank you so much for your joy. For Father, in your joy we are strong. So Lord, this morning is... We meet together in fellowship. May we know that we are in the brethren and the sistering of strong and mighty people of God. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. Do all you have in mind with us, for we're with you, heart and soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone say Amen. Amen. Go and be joyful.